Those of our esteemed panelists are ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much and welcome everyone to uh, the PNW series on race, racism and anti-racism. My name is Karen Bishop Morris and I'm an associate professor of English here at Purdue University of Northwest. Northwest. And it is my sincere honor and pleasure um, to be part of the uh, hosting that's happening today for these very esteemed guests. Um, as you know, we are dedicating this year's series to the memory and spirit of Glenn Ford. He was the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report and uh, graced this series by being the inaugural speaker uh, when we started nearly two years ago now. And we lost Mr. Ford um, in the fall. And so we are just um, so pleased to dedicate the series to him. I'd like to give some thanks uh, first and foremost to my sort of partner in crime, Professor Deepa Majumdar, who has been really the visionary for this series. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Chancellor Keon and Provost Holford for funding the series and creating the space to make it happen. There are so many folks behind the scenes, as you know, these are never sort of singular efforts. And so thank you to Rachel Pollack and Jamie Eggert, to all of the AV team, um, Greg Collins, Sharon, uh, Alan, Josiah Tipton, Brian Benjamin, to the Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, the office, uh, Sue Bremer, to our chess Dean and Gregory, and of course, to each and every one of you. There are a zillion things we could be doing right now, and you've decided to log on uh, with us. And so for that, we're grateful. Uh, we really just have three goals for today. One is that you remain open-minded and honest and active. Right? The second goal is that you leave more knowledgeable than, than you before. And lastly, we hope that you will apply what you take away today. Um, yesterday, I had the privilege of being uh, a part of a number of King celebrations. And one of them was actually a celebration in Nashville where Ilyasa Shabazz, the daughter of Malcolm X uh, was the keynote. And, you know, she left us with some questions. If not now, when, if not who, us. And uh, she, she talked uh, very passionately about George Floyd, which was actually the inspiration for this series. And she said, maybe you haven't been Derek Chauvin, or maybe you haven't been one of the three men um, convicted in the Ahmad Arbery trial, but have you been a bystander? And I found it interesting that our own Nikki Jackson, who keynoted our MLK celebration yesterday, had similar, similar uh, sentiments when she said, don't be a bystander, be an upstander. And so again, we have the privilege of having two uh, thought leaders uh, on social justice and philosophy with us today. And so we hope that you'll take something away that you can apply and recommit to, to these efforts. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Professor David Detmer. David Detmer is a professor of philosophy at Purdue University Northwest. He received his undergraduate degree from Boston University and his MA and PhD, all in philosophy from Northwestern. Professor Detmer regularly teaches the following courses, human experience in art, literature, music, and philosophy, the big questions, introduction to philosophy, ethics, critical thinking, and a variety of upper level philosophy courses. He is the author of seven books, and you see them here, Renaissance on Track, Simply Sartre, Xenophobia, Phenomenology Explained, Sartre Explained, Challenging Postmodernism, Freedom as a Value, and countless articles, book chapters, reviews, and conference presentations. Professor Detmer has served as executive editor of the Sartre Studies International Journal for 10 years. He is the current president of the PNW chapter of the AAUP and a past chair of the Purdue Northwest faculty. Leonard Harris is professor of philosophy in the Department of Philosophy at Purdue University. He is a recipient of the Franz Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award, among so many other honors and awards. 
he has published in many areas related to Africana philosophy, including pragmatism, ontology, and community. And he is the author of the philosophy as born of struggle conception of philosophy. Harris is also the author of a plethora of groundbreaking texts, including A Philosophy of Struggle, a Leonard Harris Reader with Lee McBride, Philosophy Born of Struggle, Anthology of Afro-American Philosophy from 1917, Racism. He's the editor of The Critical Pragmatism of Alain Locke. He is a co-author of Alain Locke, Biography of a Philosopher, and he's also a co-editor with J.A. Carter of Philosophic Values and World Citizenship, Locke to Obama and beyond. Harris's theories appear in articles and show up in countless U.S. and international symposia. He has served as a commissioner to UNESCO, Department of State. He's been a lecturer at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at Harvard University. He has lectured at so many universities across China, including Central China Normal University, Wuhan University, Shanghai Zhou Tong University, Hudan University, Jiamen University, and Peking University. He has been an integral part of a lecture series for the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, the Center for Critical Research on Race and Identity, the Ministry of Human Resources and Development, for the government of India. He is also represented at the University of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, and the University of Adi Ababa, Ethiopia. Harris is a co founder of Philosophy Born of Struggle, and the website is, defines this group as a community, a conference, and a textbook. Philosophy Born of Struggle will celebrate its 29th year in 2022, and you can learn more about it at pbos.com. Elainelock.com is the society that Professor Harris is also instrumental. As you know, Elaine Locke was considered the godfather of the Harlem Renaissance and had a very richly intellectual life and, and titillating life. You can learn more about the Alain Locke Society at alainlock.com. LeonardHarris.net is where you can go to learn more about the Harrisonian approach and this towering figure in Africana philosophy. It is my pleasure to turn this program over now to Dr. David Netmer and Dr. Leonard Harris. <laughs> Th thank you so much uh, for those wonderful introductions. Um, I'd like to start by asking Professor Harris, um, uh, racism is such a contested con uh, concept. People have many different ideas of how it should best be understood. Uh, you're one of the leading philosophical theoreticians of race and racism. And I wonder if you could uh, talk about uh, what you take to be the best way to conceptualize racism. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope the, the guy sounds pretty interesting. I hope to meet him one day. Uh, <laughs> seems to be well traveled and um, um, primary reason for the traveling is to see how my philosophy works outside of the United States. What does it mean um, if you're doing philosophy, to talk about philosophy in the People's Republic of China. What does it mean to talk about philosophy in South Africa? Um, what does it mean to try and present your views before a Hindu audience? Um, and what is it to be a philosopher in that sense? Is to, in some sense, challenge the ways in which we think. Uh, um, now, you add, the, 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 my view of racism is, um, and I can put it up on the screen, a share screen if you like, is, um, Straightforwardly, uh, racism is a polymorphic agent of death. Um, it's a way of killing. It's a way of, uh, 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 of destroying lives. Um, health benefits for people, uh, for, for, for enough people over generations, um, makes it beneficial. It's a way of degrading. It's a degrading set of insults. It's insulting stereotypes forcibly imposed. That's what racism is. It's a way of killing. Um, now, 
um, that's the definition of racism. Necro being, in general, is living death. That is, it's a way of talking about um, a way of talking about something that kills and prevents people from being born. That's what necro being is. Racism is one form of necro being. Um, and that's the form for which I understand the most, and that's the form which I talk about. So in that sense, racism is a material condition, first and foremost. It's a fact of life, or rather death, um, because it takes life away. So what would you say would be uh, the advantage of conceptualizing it that way? It seems to me you're conceptualizing it largely in terms of its effects, which seems to be perfectly valid. But I wonder if you could talk about why do you prefer this way of thinking about it? You know, some people talk about racism in terms of people's personal attitudes, things of that right. nature. Uh, why do you uh, why do you advocate this conceptualization rather than something like that? Okay. Do you see a share? Do you see the share screen at all? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, then what? There are competing concepts of racism. People have different views about what it means. And that seems to me person, personally per, perfectly legitimate. But we also asked the question, well, what is the best way to do this? What is the most egregious form of it? What is that which um, uh, it, it has to be versus nothing else? Now, the opposing views are usually volitionist or intentionalist theories. They say racism is something for which people decide to do. Racism is a set of uh, in bad intentions. Jorge Garcia, for example, says racism is ill will. You know, um, you lack a certain set of virtues, a certain set of virtues to care about the others. You're not showing sufficient care for the other, for others, for the others' needs. Um, phenomenologists do the same sort of thing. What is it to talk about alterity? What is it to be about the other? And are you sufficiently seeing the other in their reality? Those are volitionist theories. They think of racism in terms of uh, intentions, expectations, evaluations, judgments. I'm not, not saying racism certainly can be that. You know, um, people have different beliefs about, about that. Okay. Um, but that doesn't seem to me to be sufficiently core. Right? Um, um, one, of, one, of, one of the reasons is that um, it doesn't tell you anything about life or death at all. It just tells you about people's values and beliefs. Another way to think about racism is that it's uh, irrational. And the rationalists think in, in these terms. Um, uh, um, you think, well, okay, um, they have bad judgments. You know, um, the logicians and the rationalists, the Kantians say, well, look, people have made a bad choice. They tend to think, for example, that there are some people who are biologically inferior and other people who are biologically a, a superior. They made a bad judgment call. Right? Um, and, and so, wait a minute, people can make bad judgment calls all the time. You know, all the time people make bad judgment calls. Um, they, they make errors all the time in reasoning judgment. They overgeneralize, they overcompensate, um, they have cognitive dissonance. But, um, this also doesn't seem to be sufficiently adequate because all you're talking about is reasoned judgment. Um, what kind of reasoned judgments are you talking about? The way in which um, people who reason in English think is the way in which people who reason in Akan. You know, um, for people in Akan, it's a very different structure to say Socrates, uh, Caesar was killed, um, 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 Julius, Julius, Caesar, Julius Caesar was killed uh, by Brutus, and um, Brutus was killed, and, and, and Caesar and Brutus killed Caesar. Those are two different ways of thinking all together, two different causal relationships. But in English, in most biologic books, you don't think in those terms. So it doesn't seem to me thinking into uh, racism as a form of bad reason is also sufficient. Um, okay, so I think what gets to the matter is life or death. Who lives and who dies? Who gets to stay around as a function of this? Who loses as a function of this? Whose body is destroyed as a function of this? Who, uh, who, who has something which is, irre which is unrecoverable as a function of this? You know, when you go to a woman goes to the hospital and she's overdiagnosed, uh, um, and given an undue set of opiates or 
um, she's not specifically recommended to have her breast checked for cancer. That's not recoverable. Mm -hmm. um, they don't get to fix that later on. You die because of this. You know, there's a wonderful book by, called, by Harriet Washington called Medical Apartheid that looks at the way in which our medical system prioritizes white people over black people. How it is that we are participating in medical apartheid, two different systems for two different populations of people in the same community, in the same hospital, in the same medical wards. We get different fundamental treatments. And so our outcomes are fundamentally different. It is consequentialist, but it also is obviously um, uh, normative. It says death is the worst condition that you can have here. Yeah. Ill health is worse than just feeling bad. So there's a whole variety of arguments that I can give for thinking in those terms, but I'll stop there to say, that's why I think that intentionalist accounts miss something. So when we go, our, our colleagues say, well, look, well, well, did he intentionally do some racism? That's certainly valuable, but we're missing something. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I, I wanna pick up on your, your point about something being not recoverable. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I want to recommend to everyone this book, if you're interested in what Professor Harris is saying, I really do strongly recommend this book, A Philosophy of Struggle, The Leonard Harris Reader, where you can get a, a good collection of his writings. And um, at this point about something being not recoverable, I was struck uh, in your essay, uh, What Then is Philosophy Born of Struggle, where you... Um, uh, uh, state a disagreement with Martin Luther King, where you quote him as saying, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And you say he was just wrong. Yes. And in explaining that, you tell an interest, you give an interesting account of something that happened to your father. And if you don't mind, I think the audience would be interested in hearing that as part of your explanation of your disagreement with Martin Luther King on this point. Yes, um, Martin Luther King's concept is, is, is a common concept. It's Aristotelian, it's Socratic, it's a very ancient notion that he uses. King is a master's understanding of classes. Okay. He says, look, the, uh, the, 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 the universe is, uh, human universe is very often bad, but the arc, it bends toward justice. This is a, in, in reference to some degree is redemptive suffering, the concept of redemptive suffering. Um, we're suffering all right, but there in, in the future is a redemption. Right? That is, it, you are going to be recovered from the misery that you're having now. Okay? This is totally misguided. There is no redemption in the future. The people who died on those slave ships died on those slave ships. Our lives now do not get to recover their life. They died, they suffered, they were in prison. We don't get to we, we don't get to relive their life and they don't get to live their life. There's no redemption for them. There's no recompensation. There's no recovery. Those women who are pregnant and thrown overboard, there's no salvation for them. They hurt, they die. There's no universe where that happens. There's no moral universe where those persons who are African on Jesus Maria and out of uh, 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 all four of those women were raped, there's no future where they get to be redeemed. So the idea that the universe somehow is around us, making goodness happen for us, who's, who's goodness happening for? Our lives, even if we benefited from those lives of previous persons, doesn't mean that those previous persons get to have those benefits. Uh, so there's no arc, that's delusional. Human history doesn't provide that. Where's the ark for the justice of the Aztecs that were killed off by the Spanish? Where's the ark for any of those who were suffering from any of those Holocausts in Rwanda? Where's that ark? Where's their lives? They're dead. So my father suffered discrimination. He wanted to be an electrician. He wanted to be uh, 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 electrician, he, he worked very hard to do so, but he was not allowed to take the test. Even if we take the test, and we pass and give a better grade than the white guy, they still wouldn't allow him to be an electrician. He doesn't get repaired for that. 
He went on to become a milkman and raise five children, along with my mother. So he had a reasonably good life, but his life does, is not the one that he would have had had he been had had he been treated equitably. My father's deceased now. He doesn't get to be repaired. My opinion of his internal memory is my memory, not his. There's no redemption here. We've been told these redemption stories and part and, and, and what part we've done is to buy into them and expect some compensation. There's no compensation here. So yes, so that's what I mean when I say Martin Luther King was just wrong, but so was Aristotle. There's you no know, what, what One thing I find kind of puzzling uh, about that whole business, may, maybe you have a thought on this, is he seems to take a different view. Uh, it, it, maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but he seems to take a different view in the famous uh, letter from Birmingham jail, where he's got that quotation about uh, justice too long delayed is justice denied. And, and he has the point about how in response to you know the critics who were saying, look, history is on your side. You should just wait. You shouldn't be doing all this agitation, all this civil disobedience. No, you know, exactly. justice is going to come. And he says, you know, time is neutral. It depends on what we do. You know, so so that seems kind of inconsistent with this idea that the universe is sort of destined to to move in a certain moral direction. Am I misunderstanding, or do you think there's a contradiction there in those two attitudes? I think he has both. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's a complicated thinker. Yeah, <laughs> he has both ideas. I don't think there's a, 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 a inherent contradiction in those to believe that there's a uh, the universe is arcing toward justice at some point in the future, and simultaneously believing that we need justice right now, um, or believing that we can have hope for justice, um, and or that history will provide some future justice. Um, but we also need it right now, and we ought not spend time making excuses about waiting. Um, so I think there's a complication there, but yeah. my focus in that particular passage was on um, the notion of justice being in the universe as a kind of property, such that it's going to be guaranteed us, rather than um, um, focusing on justice within the context of right now, here and now. Um, and giving any, you know, that, that, that was the focus of that particular comment. Right. So I don't want to belabor Martin Luther King too much. I mean, it was Martin Luther King Day yesterday, so I guess that's why I'm sort of thinking in this direction. Oh, but, being, being thinker. oh yes, yeah, I, I quite agree. Um, and I was just going to ask you to comment on another of your essays. You, you write about the concept of honor and how in particular you argue that racism, I forget exactly how strong you put it, whether you say it's impossible or makes it very difficult, for black men to be honored. And then right. you discuss um, Martin Luther King as what appears to be a counterexample, and you argue it's not really a counterexample. And I thought it was kind of an interesting argument. Can you can you run through that a, a bit? Right. Now, one thing about racism um, is, is, is that it did not it, 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 it stereotypes people. Okay. So let's start there on what it is to, to stereotype. Part of what it is to stereotype is to see people as a kind, such that the feature of that kind is shared by everyone. Okay. Um, so if you um, 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 uh, uh, think about stereotypes of uh, African-American men, and uh, in terms of like Tommy Curry's wonderful book, The Man Not, where black men are too often seen as rapacious, um, pedophiles, uh, dictatorial, a rapist, so those kinds of stereotypes attach to all men and men of all and boys of all ages. So you have um, people who are treating young black men in elementary schools as if they are inherently criminal or inherently bad okay? um, because they have a stereotype and they presuppose that what the, the people that they're looking at fit that stereotype. Okay, part of the importance of dignity is that people want to feel decent about themselves, right? are worthy of themselves, feel honored. Um, and honor is always a good that's a social good. And it's, it's always a good that something that you have to give to someone in deference. 
You're saying, I trust you, even though I have no evidence of your being trustworthy. I think you're a worthy person, even though I've just met you. I'm going to revere you, even though I don't have all the facts about your life. Okay. Um, so I'm going to defer to you in some so sense. You you know, okay. Um, uh, that's valuable. Right. Um, but then at the same time, we take away that value when we perpetuate some other kinds of stereotypes. So we see King, for example, as a model. He is a model, but then at the same time, we degrade him. We, 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 stop, we stop short of appreciating his, his efficacy, his agency, um, and giving him all, all the due credit he, he, he deserves. Um, so that's what I mean by saying, look, it's important to see um, the ways in which these stereotypes are not simple one dimensional. They're variegated. Um, he still can't get a taxi cab in New York City without being worried. <laughs> um, uh, to use sort of a bomber picture. I still can't get a taxi cab in New York City. I still might be walking down the street and be shot because I'm a black male. I still face the reality of the stereotype, independent of my individual character. Independent of that. I'm seen as a certain kind of being. That's the problem. Um, now, the idea of dignity, I argue, is not something which is just simply intrinsic to us. It's something that we have to provide the conditions to make possible for. Uh, um, that's what I mean by, you know, focusing upon dignity. Uh, let me ask you um, uh, the following. Um, uh, as I'm sure you're quite well aware, right now there is a tremendous effort to prevent is that overstating it? Uh, to prevent really the discussion of race in um, classes, uh, in classrooms, in, um, in public schools. Several states have passed uh, laws banning what they call critical race theory, uh, which as far as I can tell, doesn't have anything to do with you know, Derek Bell's work or anything like that, that in academia is thought of as critical race theory. Um, and, and sometimes the language is, you know, there can't be a discussion of anything that is divisive or anything that would make someone feel guilty or anything like that. Um, and obviously, there's a tremendous need to confront uh, racism. It's an important topic. It's an important aspect of history. It's an important aspect of, of contemporary issues as well. Uh, so what is your thinking uh, about why this is happening now uh, or any other thoughts you have about this issue? Okay, let me start off with saying something, a few things controversial. Right? One is racism is not against the fabrication. Okay? Um, um, and I agree, with, I agree with Dorothy Roberts in a wonderful book called The Fatal Invention of Race. Um, race should not have been invented in the first place. Immanuel Kant was deeply misguided in, in rejecting uh, both and, and using uh, monotheism and a singlistic, singlistic picture of uh, origin. You say, aha, uh, God created one humanity, but I, after that, he created various and different kinds of humans. And each one has an in intrinsic character trait, a seed within itself, so that each race is permanently set in terms of its own patterns. Okay? Um, the Laplanders are perpetually inferior to the, to, to the Gauls. Um, the African is permanently inferior to the Chinese. Um, so that's Immanuel Kant and his philosophical anthropology, deep in, in one of the sources of our major conception of race. Um, and I agree with Dorothy Roberts, we should get rid of the concept of race altogether. Another way to think about this insane concept is America is one of the few countries on the planet Earth, on the whole planet Earth, on the whole planet, no, almost no nation on the planet Earth uses black, white as a designated race category in its own census. It does not, almost no planet, almost no country runs around with a census asking you, are you an Afro-American or are you mixed race or are you white? There's only one category in the whole history of the United States that has never changed on the American census, and that's the white male. 
White male has been on the American system ever since the American system began. Every other category has changed characters and definition. Colored, Negro, uh, 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 Irish. They all have changed in kind of characteristics, but the white male stays the same. What kind of nation is it that uses a black-white dichotomy as a legal category in a census? What kind of culture do you have that says, that the definition of black relies upon a one drop rule. One person of African heritage from some area in Africa makes you black, such that white becomes superior. Only two white people can make a white person. A white person, a black person, they're mixed. How does that work? Black becomes fundamentally categorically as a function of the category itself inferior to white. A white person in a, 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 a Han makes a mixed person. you got a concept of race that picks people out as permanent kinds, using cognitive strategies and, and language techniques to make race a permanent feature of your reality. And then you run around categorizing people in these terms and defining your world in these terms, and then say you're not racist. This is a racialized country and utilizes race to perpetuate its own form of racism. It's not a, uh, a requirement. It's something that we institutionalize and maintain. So the contemporary battle over, over critical race theory is in some sense you know, deeply misguided. You know, for example, there's a wonderful book Gone. Uh, 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 the price for the, the, the price for the pound of flesh looks at how much how much was the value of a black child under slavery? How much money was it worth? What's the value of that pound of flesh? What, what, or they were or, or Stephanie or, or Jones's Rogers, they were her property. Uh, uh, white women own black women, own black women, men. How much were they worth? How much money did they get paid? They were allowed to have better medical care than their black servants. So their lives got to be longer. But this works only because you maintain a racist society. You maintain a category of race as a permanent characteristic, such that you envision your whole future in racial terms. So those people say, don't talk about race theory. They're not giving up on race. They just don't want to start. Ask them if they're willing to give up on race. So, so what? But why do you think this is happening now? This particular uh, uh, movement against what they're calling critical race theory. Do you have any uh, any explanation no of that? Reason. I have no particular theory about why it's happening now. And we always find uh, you know, there's always a um, one movement or another movement um, to, to to reject discussions of issues of race and racism. And this is just the most current <laughs> version. <laughs> You know, I, I don't see anything particularly mysterious about it. Uh, you know, fair folks are trying to say, look, let's not talk about slavery. Let's talk about our great, great heroes in the Civil War. Right. That that's another. Yeah, that's another thing that maybe that preceded uh, this business about critical race theory is the controversy about what uh, taking down some of the statues of Confederate generals and things of that nature. Um, I, I wonder when I look at these laws about uh, critical race theory, whether it would be permissible, for example, to teach something like uh, Frederick Douglass's um, uh, speech, what to the American slave is the 4th of July? Because on the one hand, you know, it has this balance that all of these laws talk about, because in the first part of the thing, he, he goes into great detail about how much he admires the American founders for their courage and their brilliance and standing up for freedom against the British. But then when he's done doing that, he just really rips into them for the institution of slavery. Um, uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that's something that these laws would allow? Is that is that uh, a text that you think ought to be taught in uh, public schools? I, I'm not hearing you. You might be muted. Yes, I think Frederick Douglass is one of our founding founding American figures, most definitely. Um, so is Maria Stewart. 
um, uh, Lydia Childs. Um, they were um, um, all abolitionists. So is David Walker. These are all abolitionists um, who fall against the existence of slavery and had to face up to the reality of American hypocrisy. The Fourth of July speech, of course, is quite famous um, um, because you know what is Fourth of July to me. But one of the features of African American history is that they changed the definition of, or they tried to change the meaning of the words in the Constitution in the first place. Because when they were white men, they said uh, all men, they meant all men. They didn't mean all humanity. They meant males. And they specifically meant males. When they say all these rights are for humanity, they, all these rights are for all, for, for, for all the citizens, they intended to not include black people in, their, in, their, in, their, in, their, in, in, in those words. Those words have very specific meanings about benefits for white people. But the abolitionists tried to make those words change meaning, change context, change reference. Um, and they were to some degree very successful at it. So Douglas was fighting a tremendous battle to change what it is that we meant by those words. Um, but the founders were very clear about what they meant. You know, or at least rather the later founders were fairly clear about what they meant. Um, um, so, um, at least those who got hold of it, so to speak, were very clear about what they what they meant. Um, so, I think Douglas is a, a founding figure um, um, in, in that process of changing what it is that we understand this constitution to mean in the first place. Well, one of the things I think is really interesting about that speech is in the debate now about how we should think about. Uh, you know, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson owning slaves, for example, some people will argue, well, for us to harshly criticize them for that, we're being anachronistic, we're, we're applying contemporary standards where we're all, you know, against slavery, you know, to this earlier time. But with that in mind, what I think is interesting about his speech is the part where he addresses critics of him who would say, rather than being so angry, why don't you reason more? Why don't you give arguments? And he says something like, you know, the thing is so obvious, how, why should I even have to give arguments? What point would you like me to make? And he quotes the very thing you're talking about, about, you know, all men are created equal. He says, okay, is there some dispute over whether a slave is a man? Well, there are laws against teaching a slave to read. When you show me a law against teaching a dog to read, you know, then you'll have an argument. So he's essentially making the argument that, uh, look, the, the, the moral case is quite accessible. Uh, and it seems to me one could add to that, that unlike uh, some more recent politicians, you know, someone like Thomas Jefferson was quite literate and quite familiar with uh, philosophical works. He would have been able to appreciate the uh, abolitionist arguments. Uh, so what do you think about that? Do you agree? I think there's an indication of what, why existentialism is wrong. That uh, what is, is wrong? Why existentialism is wrong in some ways. That is the idea that we already know we are all human. As we are, uh, we have, uh, we are we're engaged in bad faith at least one version of bad faith, where we treat other people as inferiors when we fully know that they're not. We treat other people as non-human when we fully know that they're not. Another way to think about this is there's a wonderful book by uh, Joseph Miller called The Way of Death. When you look at The Way of Death, uh, you, you know, it, it includes um, uh, account sheets of what people were worth. Account sheets of, um, um, uh, she's a banda, but her, with a cloth, or with a cloth foot, um, um, she's a young woman with uh, with with child. Um, uh, he's an old man, and we place back next to that how much they're worth by virtue of that, and then we estimate on those same ledger sheets how many of these people are going to die on that ship before we reach shore. So we need to calculate their their price, how much we're going to sell them for, to make up for the losses of those people who die. Who die. They know fully well that these people are human. There's no mystery about this. You know, violence workers, those people who work in violence for a living, know full well that what they're attacking is another person. There's no mystery about that. You know, they have to know how to manage violence. So these violence workers are not disillusioned. Well, they may be disillusioned, but they're not um, somehow engaged in an existential moment where they're aligned to themselves. 
um, they got lots of descriptions about why these people deserve to be punished, or why we ought to make sure that um, um, they, they don't have any freedom so that we can make some profit. Uh, um, but then they fully know. Douglas's point is a reductio ad absurdum. It's absurd to say that some people are inferior to others when you're talking about people in the first place. It's a, it's, it's, it's got a wonderful abductive reductive absurdum there. It says, look, uh, I can't convince you if you're engaged in this reductio because there's no evidence. There's no form of evidentialism that's going to work. What kind of criteria would you want me to have you know, to, 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 to prove otherwise? So it's intuitively true. You, you don't need any evidence for it. You can't have any for it. Um, so, it, 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 so, so the reductio works, but that's what I mean when I say um, part of what's horrible about racism is that it's a way of killing. Uh, um, these people don't get to live well. They don't get to live long. Um, we don't have a sufficient health care system that provides benefits for them. And the conditions under which they uh, could live well are too often not addressed. Who owns these things? Who profits by it? Who gains by it? Um, that's the point of necro being, looking at racism as a form of necro being, to focus your attention slightly differently. It's not to say that uh, intentionalist theories are wrong, I mean, are no good, they are, they're very valuable. But the idea of necro being as racism, you say, look at somewhere else, look at something else as well. Look at how lives are being lost here. Uh, so you've mentioned quite a few canonical philosophers. You've talked about you know, Aristotle and Kant. And so I did want to ask you something about uh, this approach to philosophy that you're advocating, a philosophy born of struggle. That's something probably many people are not familiar with. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, a, diff a different approach to philosophy than you know, what you get out of the classical Greeks, for example. Go ahead. I want you, I, I want you to know David is trying to get me in trouble here. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm saying this up front to the audience. David is trying to get me in trouble, all right? So he's not necessarily my friend here, okay? All right. The term philosophy comes, comes out of Frederick Douglass. Okay. Um, and um, it is, says, look, but it says, let me give you a word of philosophy of reform. All concessions yet made to all this claim have been born of earnest struggle. Well, that's where that kind of phrase comes from. Um, but it also says that let's do philosophy from a completely different standpoint. No longer taking Western philosophers as somehow our, 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 our authorities and their metaphysics as a source of truth. Leave them alone. Uh, abandon them. Walk away, start afresh, think of something completely different and have a different set of heroes and sheroes. Let Maria Stewart be a shero. A little, a little, child, a little, little child be a shero, hero. Let Frederick Douglass be a hero. Let David Walker be a hero and see what they have to say. Then you start off from a very different place doing philosophy, a very different place altogether. You're asking fundamentally different kinds of questions than you would be otherwise. The kinds of questions classical philosophy wants you to know is about what constitutes wisdom and being a, 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 a unified self. Deeply misguided. You're reading people who don't know anything about cognitive science. <laughs> And you're treating them as authorities. Drop them. Start from somewhere else. That's what philosophy of struggle does. It says begin somewhere else. And I begin somewhere else altogether. Um, that's what makes it controversial because we're no longer treating them as authority figures. We're not even talking about them for that matter. Uh, we're treating other people as authorities. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if I could push back a little bit, I, I think what I would want to say that uh, philosophy, even sort of more orthodox philosophy, says you shouldn't treat anyone as an authority. It's all about the, uh, you know, who has the strongest argument, who has the best evidence. It, it's not a matter of, 
you know, taking anyone's word for anything on the basis of authority. You know, that's the delusion. That's, 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 that's false. Okay. Um, philosophers like to think that. Mm -hmm. But let's, I did an article on graduate schools in philosophy. What exactly do philosophers are, what exactly are they required to know in order to get a PhD in philosophy? And what we found, I did this work on the, on the guy of UNESCO research looking at philosophy departments around the world, including Japan. What we found is that philosophy departments, in terms of graduating with a PhD in philosophy, almost all of them require the same set of people that you have to know. Schopenhauer, Kant, uh, uh, Descartes, uh, Husserl, right? Uh, 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 and so almost all of them had a, a similar list of people you had to know in order to get a PhD in philosophy. Even those in Japan, most of the Japanese philosophers didn't even know the name of a single Japanese philosopher, but all their students knew the name of Immanuel Kant. And they, they, knew, and they could, you know, they knew the particular, particular reason. They could pass an exam by virtue of that. They knew Schopenhauer. Um, they, so they knew they can't. They knew Immanuel, they, they knew, knew Rousseau. Um, they even knew Sartre or uh, Simone de Beauvoir. They could pass an exam on that, but they couldn't name a single Chinese philosopher let alone anybody else. So the PhD programs in philosophy, almost all of them require you to know the same person. So we published this in the graduate journal, the journal of graduate, graduate education in philosophy. So the idea that somehow philosophers are just denying authority, they might say that, but they don't practice it. What they practice is a repeat of focusing on the same ages that they consider authoritarian. Or they do ancient philosophy. How many Muslim philosophers are in ancient philosophy texts and courses? Al Farabi, is he there? Al Ghazi, is he there? No. He's not there. The sophists are there. Sophocles is there. Plato was there. But there is no Western philosophy without Muslim philosophers. The translators of all over ancient Greek philosophers are in Arabic. How do you, I mean, all of a sudden you wipe them out because you want a pretentious history that gives you a picture of the past as if Plato was standing in one place and then all of a sudden he was talking to cop. Nice little white boy history. Works just well. No. So, the, I mean, it was nice to think that philosophers want to reject authority. But let's see what they in fact do. But isn't there a distinction to be drawn between, on the one hand, you know, who who do they choose to read? And there, I think you make a good point. It's 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 a rather narrow and uniform list. I think you're right about that. But uh, whoever they're reading, uh, it's not a question of just believing what they say uncritically. And th th that's what I meant by saying it's that's not. That's the cheat. That's the cheat. You set up a framework within which the only ways in which you can possibly think was within that framework. You don't get to ask questions outside of the framework because philosophers are setting up a framework for you. If right. we're going to use Aristotle's categorizations or categories, Aristotle has a very clear picture of what counts as a category. If we're going to use Euthyphro, Euthyphro's dialogue saying, Socrates says, says, well, yeah, you know, what is piety, Euthyphro? Euthyphro says, well, you know, piety is what my father's, uh, what I'm doing. Socrates says, well, no, that's not piety. You know, that's only one example of piety. I'm asking for the nature of the form. You already set up a real a way of thinking. You're asking a question about what is the nature of the form. And then you're going to turn around and tell me that you don't set up a categorization system that defines what kinds of questions you can ask. Tell that to somebody else. I know better. No. <laughs> You say you are engaged in, in generalized thinking and that we are going to compete against authority, but then you set up a reasoning system that entraps you in a way of thinking. So Euthyphro can't get out of. You're never going to win out against Socrates. So as Euthyphro says, well, you know, maybe it's what the gods want that counts as piety. Well, Socrates says, well, well, which god? Because Euthyphro doesn't see that Socrates has presupposes the possibility of the answer to the question requires him to give a form. And he can't give a form because he doesn't have a derivation manual that's going to give the name of the form such that each instance of piety, he can plug into it. 
That's what Socrates wants. Euthyphro doesn't see it. Okay, that's what I mean by saying, yes, I understand we want to talk about philosophy as something that we are going to engage in critical thinking, which we do a lot. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, I'm claiming that we set up a system within which you are entrapped. And you don't get out of it unless you step away. I stepped away. Walk away from the asylum. It's an asylum. Step away from it. Another way to think about this is how many psychiatric institutions do you know of that have closed down because they fixed everybody in the asylum? Which one is shut down? So we had a method that's going to fix everybody who has mental illness. And it shut down because they fixed everybody. Hmm. Maybe Weber was right. Bureaucracy creates bureaucracy. It doesn't destroy bureaucracy. It creates new rules. It finds new distinctions, new clarifications. That's what philosophers do, among other things, in order to perpetuate the same bureaucracy. But it doesn't fix itself. It can't. It's not a matter of intentions. It's a matter of structure. So I reject the view that philosophers are just simply a bunch of guys sitting around being critical. They never led anything being critical. They didn't even really, 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 they didn't need a civil rights struggle. A bunch of people, a bunch of men and women who had nothing to do with philosophy, they did it. Uh, another idea of yours that I wanted to ask you about uh, is tolerance. Uh, you had some interesting things to say about. See, I told you, he's still not here to get me in trouble. I want you to know that. <laughs> hey, you gotta watch this guy, all right? You gotta, you gotta help me out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought those ideas were interesting. I, 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 I'd like to hear you, uh, uh, you know, explain them to the audience. All right. The con there's, a, there's a wonderful program in South Africa. The South African activists were really brilliant geniuses in promoting uh, uh, truth and justice commissions mm -hmm. that allow people who were otherwise being engaged in perpetual hatred of one another to come together and try and find some common ground. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, one of the few places in which in the world that you know initiated this kind of activity there are other places that have done so too to um heal um so that's a good thing i mean i think you know truth is just doing a great 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 little good in that regard but it also is continuing to point certain conception of virtues um one of the virtues is the virtue of forgiveness mm -hmm. and it presupposes that everyone ought to forgive in the same kind of way so I said, look, um, this is a conception of virtue that's misguided. It presupposes a certain set of um, defining characteristics and defining virtue. So let's get rid of the definition of virtue here, first of all. That's what I mean by walking away from the asylum. You don't have to buy into the definition of virtue in the first place. Or virtues consist of there's certain sort of a placid characteristics that seem to be good for the oppressed but not for the oppressor. You tell the oppressor to love your neighbor, but you tell the oppressor to be competitive. How does this work? Uh, competition not become a virtue, only sacrifice does. Works for one population, but not so for the other. So anyway, let's walk away from the concept of virtue to begin with. So we're gonna walk away from virtue ethics. Bingo. Okay. Um, maybe if a woman has been, had a Coke bottle rammed, rammed into her vagina by a bunch of white men uh, who are uh, having a play date, raping her. Maybe she's not in a very big hurry to forgive those white men for raping her once they're confronting the truth of justice commission. Maybe she needs to holler at them to heal herself. Maybe she needs to condemn them for what they did to her to heal herself. I think that's maybe a virtuous and a very good approach if she needs to do that to heal herself and not be told that she's inherently a bad person unless she ignores the harm that they've done to her. Unless he, she helps them feel better about themselves, um, but not herself. So that was the argument against tolerance, that sometimes it has a limitation, especially when you're talking about healing. Yeah, I, I think that's 
uh, quite evident. I mean, tolerance has to be balanced against other considerations. Uh, th there's something to be said for tolerating some things you don't like, but not it, not everything. You know, some things are intolerable. Right, that was the point for tolerance. Um, but that's the idea is that um, um, let's look at virtues in a much broader perspective. You know, um, and not so narrowly that somehow persons who are um, trying to heal, so to speak, are discounted uh, or are, are seen as, 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 as inappropriate um, um, when they express their feelings. Another way to think about this is that it's okay um, for um, people we see as fully human to be agitated, to be mad. But if we see a black person as mad, then there's something wrong with them. They're defective. Um, they need to change their attitude. They need to be reticent. Wait a minute. We know good and well that um, sometimes pe being mad and upset is, is, is cathartic, is helpful. It helps you recover. Um, but we're not supposed to recover. So that's what I mean by having a much broader sense of what counts as the virtues. Um, that's such a narrower sense. Mm -hmm. So let, let me ask you this, because I think we're nearing the end of the part where I'm asking you questions. Um, can you talk about uh, your current uh, work, any current uh, research projects that you're engaged in? My current research project is to develop the notion of necro being a little further, um, and how, it works, how it works in terms of racism, um, the sociology associated with it, uh, with, with the theory, um, to focus upon you know, uh, issues of health care, um, my other focus is on the nature of philosophy, looking at what counts as philosophy against uh, Gallo Deleuze, uh, against Husserl on what is philosophy, uh, Heidegger on what is philosophy, um, uh, 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 Agamben on what is philosophy. Um, to look at what that counts as, what, what, counts, what, what counts as it, the, um, yeah, the debate with the, uh, the incoherence of the philosophers, uh, uh, those great works of the ancients. Um, and the difference between philosophy and theology. Um, why are we making that distinction? Um, so those are my current current projects to develop the notion of necro being. But the third project has to do with dignity, um, um, value of dignity, and how you're going to understand them within the context of a culturally complex world. Um, our burial rituals, for example, um, allow for cremation, allow for burying of the whole body. Um, um, and then we consider, we consider those various forms of dignity, but other people use the burning of the body for several days. Other people use uh, the leaving of the body out in, in nature for the animals to eat. And what counts as dignity? And he said, a radically different approaches to, 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 to honoring our deceased. Um, um, so those are the three projects that I'm engaged in at this time. Thank you. Uh, so let me ask uh, Deepa and Karen, is it time for questions from the audience? I think so, Karen. Uh, did you have, do you want to chime in, Karen? Sure, yes. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Harris and Dr. Detmer. Um, I guess I'm happy to, to start us off with a question. And I was wondering, Dr. Harris, if you could speak to us a little bit about Locke. Um, particularly, um, he was the first African-American Rhodes Scholar, and yet he did not take the degree, even though he had written this brilliant 400-page thesis on value, on the concept of value, and some say it was because of his sort of titillating life at Oxford off campus, his extracurriculars, and others say it was due to racism. Um, so that's part one of my question. What do you say? Why do you believe he didn't earn the degree? Okay, let me say a little bit about Locke, all right? First, Alain Leroy Locke uh, graduated from Harvard University in 1918 with his first PhD in philosophy from Harvard. Um, uh, uh, um, and um, on his doctoral dissertation, the problem of uh, classification, the problem of the classification of theory of value. That was the title of his doctoral dissertation. He submitted that doc doctoral dissertation to his dissertation advisor on September 17, 1917, although he graduated in the June class of 1918. Okay. Now, the first couple of pages of that doctoral dissertation has Locke condemning his own advisor. 
as well as John Dewey, for having a misguided concept of value. How is it that in 1917, a small five foot two African American, you know, uh, writes a doctoral dissertation, stands in front of his advisor and says, look, you're just fundamentally wrong. If one of my students did that, i like, okay, but he, he does this, okay? Here's a, a person who has got deep self-confidence in his own ability. He wrote that dissertation, a good deal of it, of course, in England when he was a Rhodes Scholar, but he also left England and went to Germany for a year. Um, study with Simmel. Simmel was the founder of what we now know as sociology. In those days, it wasn't called sociology. He was the founder of what we now know as sociology. But he spent a, a semester in, as a student aiding Simmel in, 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 in Germany. Then he came back to the United States, tried to get a job with, uh, uh, in the South, but he wound up uh, uh, with, 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 with Booker T. Washington, but he wound up with at Howard University. Um, and his first series of lectures before he got his doctorate degree between 1915 and 1916 was a, a series of lectures called Race Contact. How do you have a lecture series before the um, NAACP, National Association of Colored People? How do you go before the National Association of Colored People and say, hello, hello, uh, race is a fabrication. You can't get on a, 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 a trolley car, bus, car, not, everything's segregated. Race is fundamentally misguided. You have to have some serious self-confidence. <laughs> Another way to think about this person, Langley Royla, is to think about what he did in terms of the definition of the beautiful. I'm gonna put up a share screen right now, all right? And his, his first book, The New Negro, can you see that? Yeah. Not yet. Uh, okay, let me see this. How are you? There we go. Now, can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. This is the Brown Madonna. Elaine Locke's first book, The New Negro, which founded the Harlem Renaissance, has this picture in the front of the cover. He gets letters from Black people saying, what is wrong with you? How can you define the beautiful in this way? She represents that which is the beautiful, serene, sophisticated, urbane, peaceful, loving, focused, determined. She is the beautiful. If you want to know what counts as beautiful, look at her aesthetic characteristics of form and shape and serenity. Locke thinks those are universal forms, not reducible to race. The picture is drawn by a white German, my whole race. All of them in there, all the color pictures in the 727 in the, in the anthology are drawn by Ryan Home Reese. How do you have an anthology called The New Negro? And all the color pictures in there are drawn by a white man. And the first article in there is by a white man. How do you do that? Three Jews in there. What's going on? In this anthology called The New Negro, you're redefining race. You're actually getting okay. to the second part of my question, which is, and so was that the conflict with, because NAACP, National Urban League, they kind of rejected him. Uh, yeah, well, you know, that's race. <laughs> was it the bravado? I mean, or was it, you know, his sort of alliance with, you know, Kellogg was a good friend, his association right. with, I mean. It wasn't, it wasn't the sexuality of the game environment. Uh, Locke had a different view of reality than Du Bois. Locke pushed a different philosophy. He's not doing this unintentionally. He's doing it intentionally. He's redefining categories through anthologies. So he, you know, one, the second most important influential African American in intellectual history is after after W. E. D. Boys is Locke. I mean, so he's not being rejected. He's being accepted in lots of places. There are conflicts, most certainly. Now, the reason he didn't get finished his doctorate degree at, at Oxford is because his um, advisor rejected his, his, his thesis, his area of interest. He was interested in pragmatism. And his advisor said that wasn't going to work. You know, he was interested in what's called Australian value theory. And at that time, the philosophers were primarily doing analytic philosophy, looking at logic and math. And he's coming along here talking about emotions and values. This is not going to work. You know, and further, Locke and P.K. Sime 
P.K. Sime was one of the three founders of the African National Congress. They were buddies at Oxford in their graduate school. They run around, you know, members of the horse club. Right. You know, <laughs> these, these cats are hanging out, man. Locke has removes off campus because he don't want to be bothered with his white people on his, and, and, and got him a, a southern roommate. He says, forget you. He moves off campus, got his own apartment. He's got a tailor. This is not going to work. <laughs> there are lots of reasons why he didn't finish, right? Okay. But um, 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 the American uh, members of the Rhodes Scholars, before he ever got there, traveled from the United States all the way over to England to try and convince the Rhodes Scholarships, the Rhodes Scholarship Board in England, not to give Locke a Rhodes Scholar. Wow. Because we can't have a Negro outrank a white people. We can't have a Negro produce uh, letters and, 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 and material that's better than white men. It doesn't look good for us. So they spent a lot of time trying to prevent Locke from going to Oxford. But once he got there, he was thinking, not thinking about America at all. You know, get that, you know. Um, so that's some of the reasons. There's much more complicated reasons why he didn't finish at Oxford. But Hertford College now honors Locke. Yes. And there's a group of women at Hertford College. Um, um, I'm a member of um, um, Men for Women in Philosophy at Hertford College, who are also reading, reading Locke. And remember, this, this book, The New Negro, has people in it that, you know, range from presidents of colleges, um, um, white sociologists, historians, um, to um, a, 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 a bisexual men and women. But the only person who knew that was Locke. So he presents this new Negro as a person interested in being self-confident and no longer a minstrel. He changes the character of what we think of as the beautiful by such pictures as as this, the Brahma Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So can I can I chime in at this point, Karen? Yes. 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 All right. First of all, thank you so much, Professor Harris, Professor Detmer. We're really uh, obliged and really very, very grateful to you. And thank you, the audience. I have a set of five questions actually, but there won't be time. So I'm actually going to reverse things and start with our program first, the rest of the program. And then if there's time left over, I'll ask maybe one question. Does that sound okay? I don't know what's the rest of the program. Um, so here is, is um, here, can you see the screen? I, to, yes. So today's yeah. event is, is already in this first flyer. Our next event is a two-day event, Feb 22nd and Feb 23rd. And this is going to be different from the other events because it's going to be hybrid. It's going to be in-person plus via Zoom. And so on the 22nd, it's going to happen on the Westfield campus at the Dworkin, Dworkin Center. And Feb 23rd, which is a Wednesday, it's going to happen on the Hammond campus. And uh, there's going to be a mix and mingle after the presentation. And the timings are different as well. These are all central standard time. So Feb 22nd is 12.30 to 2 p.m., which is roughly the time that we use today. And 23rd, it will be 3.30 to 5.45 p.m. will be the actual presentation. And then 5.45 to 6.30 p.m. will be the mix and mingle. So this is a different kind of event, but you're absolutely welcome. We really want crowds to come. And then on March 1st, there's a presentation, uh, a shared presentation. Professor Yamada from uh, Purdue Fort Wayne will be presenting on the whole idea of colorblind. And I'll be doing something on beauty because I am really intrigued by problematic and I'd say sometimes even evil forms of aesthetics. Um, so I'll be speaking about beauty. And so that's on March 1st. It is 12.30 to 1.45 p.m. It is Zoom synchronous. Besides the Feb event, every other event is Zoom synchronous and virtual. Um, on March 22nd, we have Professor Parashar from Purdue Northwest, who's a physicist, who will be speaking about prejudice in the STEM fields. So the title is From Barriers and Biases to Belonging, Lessons from a Female Physicist. Um, and so she'll be doing that presentation on March 22nd, which is Zoom synchronous. And then April 6th will be a, a dialogue or conversation between Professor Sipes of Purdue Northwest and Vince Emanuel, who's an alumnus of, of our university. And both of them are 
our ex-Marines, and they'll be speaking about the racial face of war, because uh, wars and wars have happened on in countries uh, which are not, not only non-Western, but non-white. And so there is a racial aspect to US wars. And so that's our last event for this semester. So that's as far as the program goes. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to um, email me. And I'd be happy to answer your questions as best as I can. Okay, so I'll stop sharing here. By my clock, there's like one minute left. May I ask one question? Is that okay? Go ahead. Okay. All right. I've written my questions down, but it'll be easy to read it out. Um, so my first question is, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I have a total of five, six questions, but I can, I can email you the rest. So my first question is, I think you're completely right that the whole idea of race has to be overcome. I must say, as somebody who was not born here, I, it really took my breath away how, how uh, corporeal it is. You know, and, and I'd never seen this in my country of origin, this kind of race consciousness, you know. So my question is, the category of race is truly corporeal and should be overcome. We're not just our bodies. Uh, so to overcome racism, it seems to me, you're right, we must first overcome race consciousness. But how does one bring this about? Yeah, nice and easy question. Um, uh, one reason I'm not a, a, a pessimist is that um, the United States is only 500 years old. Humanity has been around for 10,000 years. Um, there's no reason to think that what we the categories we live in now will be very long living at all, let alone the country. Um, so we may not have a nice, neat, um, a ten point program, um, but it's subject it's, it's subject to happen one way or another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things happen by through catastrophes. Sometimes they happen accidentally. But I don't know. I don't have a ten point program on how how America can stop being a racist country or racialized country, mm -hmm. um, especially when you have your national leaders all believing in race, mm -hmm. uh, or most of your academicians believing in race. Yep. Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. So if you have another question that I can answer, I, I, I'll gladly entertain that. Or if anybody else has a question that they want to ask, I'll gladly entertain that in the next 30 seconds that I have. I did have one more question, if I may, which is that, you know, I get what you're saying about justice not necessarily happening to the individual. Oh. But do you think that justice happens in history? Uh, no. In history, uh, not at the level of the individual, but collectively through repentance, recompense, no. consciousness? No. I mean, are we yeah. better off now? Yeah, the answer to your question is no. You know, um, the idea that somehow um, the working class of England is going to get justice in, uh, in, uh, in the working class of, of 1844 uh, England is going to get justice in 20. 2021 or 2022 is misguided. The working class of England is dead. They won't get justice. The class itself no longer exists. The kind of thing that it was no longer exists. Even if the workers of England now um, got liberated, it wouldn't do anything about the past one or past injustices to happen to workers in the past. Um, and what counted as justice for them certainly would not count as justice for us. Um, uh, the, the shopkeepers don't, those kinds of professions don't even exist. So it's nice to think of ont ontological entities as stable entities. But once you give up ontological entities as stable entities, that is classes as stable kinds or races as stable kinds or is, uh, uh, groupings as stable kinds, then you no longer have the delusion that somehow, you know, the arc of justice, uh, the, arc of, the arc of history bends toward justice of the kind. Mm -hmm. you can have, certainly, hopefully, um, there will be more liberation of people in the future of all sorts of folks. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea that you've gotten justice by virtue of that is a nice, comfortable feeling. Um, I like to think that too, but uh, no. Okay. No, um, no, yeah, no, no. We do have one question from an audience member. So Mita, do you want to ask your question? Maybe unmute yourself. Oh, uh, thank you. Just that within the academy, what can we do? Um, both of you, David, as well as Professor Harris, you brought this rich um, background of your research to us. But in terms of something doable in a short period of time, um, what can be done within the academy? Thank you. Mm -hmm. David? 
Well, I, I, I don't have a magic formula. I think it is important to talk about these issues uh, rather than sweeping them under the carpet. I'd say that's that's the main thing I would say. Beyond that, I don't have a magic formula. I think what you can do is to emphasize health care resources at your campus so that um, health care resources at your campus are not discriminatingly uh, distributed among those students. You know, how many students, minority students are aware of uh, campus resources for their own health care? Uh, you know, and, well, some of them come all from different kinds of communities, all come from different kinds of communities. But we also know that statistically, black people get the least, least attentiveness to, the, to their well-being. Uh, are they aware of those resources? Are you encouraging people to focus on acquiring assets so that in the future, they won't be subject to the miseries um, that they're subject to now in these hospitals or these clinics. We know that communities that have uh, clinics um, have better health care. You know, those folks have better health care than others. Um, what kind of health care information is available to your students um, now and in the future? So I think those are some practical things that we can do to imp impact upon um, the well-being of our communities within the, within the context of the academy. Um, look at the structure. The rules, ask hard questions. Who owns this stuff? You know, another way to think of this is I'll share one last picture. I think I can share it. Yeah, I think I can share it. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's a picture. Uh, I think I can, yes, here we go. Uh, uh, drawn by an African artist from South Africa, Kazani Chirari, Genesis. And what's striking about it is that you see the African woman in the front, in the foreground, how she's dressed. Right? Uh, she has a Bible in her hand and a sort of Catholic rock um, and uh, uh, pearls on, on, on her neck and a, and a Christian cross. And she's and in, in, in another version of this picture, she has a, a cartwheel that says shopping for Jesus. Shopping for Jesus. Now look at the background. The background is where, where she came from. Those women have pressed leather and ornament. What counts as the beautiful for them is pressed leather ornaments, uh, strings around her hair. But the good boy Livingston brought the Bible, shopping for Jesus. That's cultural alteration within a relatively short period of five, four or five generations where the African woman now looks like this. Now that's how she's defining what it counts as the beautiful. Where in the past, that's what she counted as the beautiful. But none of the acronyms have any value anymore. Cowrie shells and bees no longer have any value. What has value is her feathered hat. Ask hard questions. How does this function as a positive good? Who owns this shirt? Who made these gloves? Are your students asking hard assets questions? If they're religious, are they asking hard religious questions? Her job is to destroy these people, destroy their beliefs. As a missionary, African-American missionaries, their job is to destroy traditional African beliefs. How does this work? And how, what is the impact on their health? So that's the kind of thing that I suggest we do substantively, you know. Um, now, I have no roadmap like, like David. I have no 10-point program. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things I think are practical. And like June Jordan says, um, we are the ones we have in her poem for South African women. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Thank you so much. Um, we wanted to thank all of you in the audience. Special thanks to Dr. Detmer and Dr. Harris. And we wanted to bring to your attention Dr. Harris's book again, A Philosophy of Struggle, the Leonard Harris Reader. So it's in the chat already. Um, I think it's in the chat. Uh, if, if it's not, and if you have questions, 
It's there? Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, I'm sure uh, Googling it should be pretty easy too. So thank you all so much. And we hope to see you for the future programs, for the future events as well. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your questions. Thank you for your- Thank you, Trivia. I know that's right. <laughs>